Um, so today we'll be talking about the circles of connectivity from Abu Dhabi to the rest of the world. And uh, to kick it off, uh, I'll start talking about the earliest uh, circles we can kind of identify. Um, but first, I'd like to define uh, what we mean by uh, circles of connectivity. So, of course, <coughs> over um, the course of history, there's, of course, um, a multitude of ways to talk about human interaction and the human experience and how uh, we manage to kind of um, create a sense of community and, and establish settlements and trade and watch these thrive and grow and intermingle over a series of years. But we would like to simplify it for the sake of simplifying it um, into circles. And so, of course, these have a multitude of ranges and sizes. And um, I'll start us off with a, a, a small circle um, and a, the oldest one in the series. And then I'll pass it on to um, my guest speakers here. Um, so, for example, let's talk about the Neolithic in Arabia and more specifically the Abu Dhabi Islands. I'll speak about the Al-Dhafra Islands. Um, as we can see, a very clear um, community um, that's very, um, very intimate, very uh, interconnected. And one way we can uh, see that tangibly is the plaster vessels of Al-Dhafra. So the plaster vessels uh, that we have in Al-Dhafra are strictly in Al-Dhafra and we don't see them. In the Neolithic, um, in the early Neolithic, we don't have pottery as common as we do uh, later on. So some sites in Umm al Qiwain will have pottery, the Abayt pottery that comes from Mesopotamia. But in Al-Dhafra, we're looking at something slightly earlier. And so the Abayt pottery or Mesopotamian pottery comes in a, a bit towards the middle and then towards the end of the uh, Neolithic there. But very early on, we have something very specific called the plaster vessels. And they, sh they show up on Delma Island. We have them on uh, Marawah Island and Gaga Island, and on the mainland in Jabal Vanna. So this creates a small circle. And within this circle, you have these uh, plaster vessels that are locally made, locally painted, and uh, in a very, um, well, in a very uh, contemporary design that's familiar to you guys. So it's inspired by geometric uh, patterns like textiles and it's red and black, which is something you still see today in Bedouin tents, for example. Um, so that's one small circle that we still see throughout thousands of years of history. And then um, we kind of, uh, we kind of see it end around, the last plaster vessels are around Delma, uh, the, settle the settlement on Delma Island. That's the last we see of the circle. It kind of closes, and then that's it. It's a very short, um, it's a very short, small kind of radius, uh, shorter range circle of connectivity. So that's one example. Um, and then we kind of, uh, <laughs> Peter will talk about more. Um, if you could elaborate on the uh, kind of shift into the more medium range circles that we see towards uh, uh, Omanar, for example, or when we kind of cross over into the Bronze Age. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much, Nora. Um, that's exactly right. So the idea here is that we perceive or understand prehistory as a series of, in this region, as a series of concentric circles, sometimes concentric, sometimes globular, um, which move out from like 8,000 years ago until today, when in fact we could say that, that the circle of connectivity which Abu Dhabi finds itself in today is actually beyond the planet. It is ad astra in Latin, it is to the stars, and so that we can see this sort of connectivity all the way back from prehistory. And I think part of, uh, part of what makes that interesting is that for people to move around and to either, as is the case in the islands in the Neolithic, to move from spot to spot, um, to trade, to uh, undoubtedly uh, build sea craft during the Neolithic period, and to fish, um, uh, to dive for pearls, it requires a, a sense of curiosity about the world. And so, um, as, as Nora's described, that's the situation in the Neolithic period. Um, but what's interesting is that after that, in the Bronze Age, which we could say 
starts around 3000 BCE, about 5000 years ago, we see those sort of embryonic stages of, uh, of, of trade and connection expand very rapidly. So one of the things that I like to think about, um, well, I like to think about many things, but one of the I like to think about in terms of the prehistory and uh, archaeology of this region is that already by 4,500 years ago, people were sailing boats to Iraq, to Mesopotamia, and they were sailing boats out through uh, the Straits, and they were sailing them to India and Pakistan. And on these boats, they were um, connecting with different civilizations, with different worlds, worlds which they didn't know the languages of. We don't know what language people spoke here at that time at all, and we don't know what language people spoke in uh, South Asia at that time either. We know what they wrote, but we don't know what they spoke. Uh, we, we can't read what they spoke, actually. But, um, but that sort of connectivity brings new ideas and it brings different goods back into this center uh, where we find ourselves today, in the center of the, the lower Arabian Gulf. Um, so to make that possible, to make that expanding circle of connectivity, it relied exactly already on the technology which existed. So as in the Neolithic people uh, period, people were diving for pearls, People were diving for, uh, were, were um, uh, hunting and um, uh, consuming dugong and sharks, as Dr. Mark Jonathan Beach can attest, having studied the shark bones from several of these sites. They required a technology, and that technology gets utilized again. So in fact, in the Bronze Age, the initial connections which are made are fueled by innovative use of uh, locally developed technologies. So much so that during the Bronze Age, there's even a particular type of boat. Believe it or not, there's a type of boat called a Magan boat, which is actually named after this region. The name of the boat itself speaks to the long-held history of seafaring in this country. Uh, it, Magan is a Sumerian word from uh, ancient Iraq. Um, and so that, and some of these boats were massive. I mean, some of them, some of them could carry 20 tons of material across across the oceans. Um, and so all of these connectivity, all of this, all of this sort of sense of expansion and connection, starts to bring this region into a broader context. Now, what's interesting, and I, I'm going to turn over to my colleague in a second um, to talk about the later periods and then we can have a more open conversation about this. Um, but what's interesting is that like all linear historical processes, things which seem to be moving in a certain direction at a certain time, things change. And uh, the way in which those circles of connectivity work shift again 3,000 years later. What's incredible is that at that time, maritime technology seems to be much less utilized because they have a different sort of ship, the ship of the desert, <laughs> camels. So the way in which people connect at that point changes again, and overland trade brings in new ideas into the region. It brings fresh ideas. It brings languages and script, ways of writing which were not um, uh, so common. And then it changes again in the first centuries BC. And maybe, Tim, you could talk a little bit about what happens maybe in the, the late pre-Islamic period, uh, since uh, it's a subject of your, your current research, and then also uh, in the early Islamic period, what happens. And then maybe we could dive into some more detailed discussions. But this is uh, Professor Tim Power. Who's going to talk? He's from University of UAE, and he's going to he's going to introduce introduce this amazing um, evidence that he knows so well. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. So yeah, I mean, I think with this idea of these uh, concentric circles, which is to say, uh, nested interaction networks, um, if we borrow a conceit from world systems theory, um, they are not 
static, okay? They, they, they change over the centuries. Is that better? So they can hear me all the way over there. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, these, these concentric circles are not static, and they, they change, they mutate over the centuries. They respond to changes of supply and demand. Um, and there's a real uh, change, I think, in, in the, the place of the, of the Emirates and the, and the wider Arabian Peninsula in the ancient world around the uh, second century BC. This is a really important moment in world history because uh, we are told that uh, Hipparchus, a, a Greco-Alexandrian merchant, discovers the, the, the pattern of monsoon winds which allow people to navigate between the Mediterranean and the Western Indian Ocean. So from about the second century BC on, we start to see um, a growing intensity of trade uh, with India. Now, trade with India is something that goes way back actually to the, to the Bronze Age, um, but it, there's this intensification. I mean, Strabo in the first century BC uh, talks about you know, 120 ships sailing from the uh, Egyptian port of Mias Hormos um, every year bound for the Indian subcontinent. Now, you might think, well, what's that got to do with the Emirates? But basically, the, um, the trade networks that are developing in that period, uh, this Indo-Roman trade linking the Mediterranean to the um, Indian subcontinent, start then to uh, create um, subsidiary networks. So we start to get trade um, with uh, objects from uh, the Roman world, um, exported through Egypt and the Red Sea to India, and then actually re-exported from India to the Arabian Gulf. And, and there's two sites in particular here in the Emirates, uh, Dibba on, on the East Coast and um, Eddur on, on the Gulf Coast, where we find um, reasonable quantities of uh, Mediterranean material culture, which I think speaks of a kind of advancing globalization in which the economies of different uh, regional networks start to link up to the point that, um, you know, when we look at the, the Fayoum mummy portraits, for example, which are these amazing um, uh, sort of uh, portraits on, 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 the, on, on the mummies of deceased uh, uh, Greco-Egyptians, um, you know, we see these, the, you know, pearls, pearls from the Arabian Gulf being uh, brought into um, uh, Egypt and then the Mediterranean. So these kind of networks um, start to link up and they start to stimulate uh, subsidiary networks, which I think leads to um, an expansion of the economy. Um, but I think you know, this uh, trade with, with India um, actually serves as a, as, a, as a platform, a foundation, as we move forward into the early Islamic period, um, for the integration first of East Africa and then farther afield to uh, East Asia. Tim, I have a question on that, if that's okay, if I may throw in a question. Um, so okay. we, we talk about the, um, the discovery of the monsoon winds by the Parkas in Egypt. Um, you know, there is, to what extent do you feel that because in this region there are there are less written sources, that an earlier discovery of how to use the monsoon winds um, during the Bronze Age, for example, might would have already existed, but simply wasn't uh, appreciated by the sort of canonical Western classical uh, tradition which places the Mediterranean at the center of the, of the universe. Do you think that's possible? I think that's 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 valid, but also, I mean, of course, we have the the archaeological evidence. Okay, so um, you know, the the in, in the, the Malayha culture of the sort of uh, fourth third centuries uh, BC, um, the proportion of imported material is quite small, and and such as there is seems actually to be coming through the uh, the caravan networks. So we get these little um, uh, beehive alabaster vessels, which are probably being made in, in uh, southwest Arabia and, and coming up through the Wadi al Dawasir up to Thurj, and then being re-exported over to um, southeast Arabia. I mean, that shows you that in this sort of uh, third century period, the, the caravan networks are still thriving. 
Um, but as we move into the second century BC, those caravan networks drop off and are replaced by uh, maritime networks. And I think the way this happens is a sort of uh, incremental expansion. So the reason why the, the, the Greeks, or the, the Ptolemies quite specifically in Egypt, are involved with the discovery of these networks is that in the third century BC, they're actually fighting a series of battles with their rivals, the Seleucids in um, Iraq and Iran. And essentially, in that period, war is done using elephants. So that the Ptolemies are kind of moving down the Red Sea into Africa to acquire African war elephants, and the Seleucids are moving down the coast of Iran towards India to, to get these Indian war elephants. And they're, they're meeting in, in the region of the Levant and fighting these huge battles. Okay? So it's quite fascinating how this sort of military political complex leads um, ultimately to a sort of leap into a more kind of uh, private and uh, economic, even a sort of capitalist model in which independent mercantile resources are poured into uh, you know, developing trade routes with um, India. Amazing. So um, let's bring it back to uh, kind of draw some similarities between all these different circles we're talking about and why we kind of uh, uh, framed it the way we did. So let's talk about what could the different factors that facilitate uh, connectivity in all these periods. So let's talk about uh, something that's, so for example, um, marine inundation um, a couple thousand years ago. So the Arabian Gulf isn't actually as old as you think it is. Um, probably somewhere between 14,000 to 8,000 BP, that's when it starts flooding in. And that's when uh, it creates a divide between the Neolithic communities on either side of this, uh, of the sea. So. Um, does that actually facilitate more connectivity or does it make it much harder to uh, facilitate channels of communi uh, communication between either sides? So things like that. I think uh, the sea specifically for each and every period we're talking about is actually a huge facilitator of inter uh, this kind of interconnectivity between all periods of time in this region especially. I think that's a really good point, and I think I would borrow, um, uh, you know, we are all, uh, we are used to living on the land, right? We are terrestrial beings, all of us, um, but there is a school of thought, uh, anthropological, archaeological school of thought, which sees the sea as, a, we, we, we see the sea uh, uh, or, or water as a place in which people move across. Um, but in fact, in prehistory, we can, we can see at various times that the sea was the landscape. Um, they, people saw, and, and the, the terrestrial, which is the earth, or the flat, uh, yeah, physical earth, terra, um, was, was the barrier. And I think that's something, Nora, which your work in, uh, in the Abu Dhabi Islands has made very clear, right? That in those islands, um, they, are, they are not just utilizing the sea, but they are, the sea becomes the landscape, the resource. To the extent, we, we, cannot, we cannot perceive of ourselves as being anything other than bound uh, to the physical grounds, uh, things which we recognize. But in prehistory, I suspect, we, people saw themselves as primarily of the sea. They were of the sea and not of the land. And, I say this without any justification whatsoever or I can give you justification. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, I mean, I think it's just a way of seeing the interpretation of information is that when we, as, as archaeologists, when we, we, all of us, the three of us are terrestrial archaeologists. We invited here today a maritime archaeologist who unfortunately couldn't make it. But in his mind, I would say if he was here, he would say that the, the, the culture was rooted within the sea during the Bronze Age and, and, and later periods. But I guess, I, Nora, I have a question for you, which is, um, you know, of your, of your discoveries on the islands, what are some of the most um, surprising things that you've discovered which sort of um, provide evidence for the way in which people were moving across in between these islands? And another question I have for you is, were they islands at that stage? Uh, like, for example, Marawa and Raga 
And Sir Bani asked Dalma, were these actually islands or something else? Because that's another aspect, I think, of the, the story. All right, so first I'll go back to we are of the sea, because I think that's really important. Um, so in, in, uh, in the UAE, I'll speak in the UAE, but of course this applies for the southern, southern Arabian Gulf, it's that we don't have um, a fertile crescent, we have a fertile coast. So our Neolithic is strictly based on the subsistence strategies that they had at the time where it's, it's heavily dependent on marine resources. And so during our excavation in Mrawah in 2022, when we were excavating a new building, we started finding uh, animal, marine mammal bones that have literally no other function, um, no, no function other than um, something that's symbolic. So for example, we found a pair of dolphin ears, to put it simply, that were just sat by each other, sat by one another on a platform in this uh, multi-cell multi complex building that had a bunch of burials in it. I think we uh, estimated 14 people were buried in there. Um, no, sorry, seven. Anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, um, within that cell as well, within the different cells that uh, had burials in them, uh, we had one of the burials with, that was completely covered in turtle carapaces, so turtle bones, turtle shell bones, um, and then the other um, Socotra cormorant bones. And there are always these pieces of m mammals like dugongs, like a dolphin rib or a dugong rib, that's also like, you will find that within the burial. And it's not like it's a post-deposition, so it's not after they buried them, they decided to reuse the rooms. No, that's, that wasn't the case at all. So they're not like eating in these rooms. These uh, these marine mammal bones are very symbolic, and they kind of—it's exactly what Peter's saying. It's we are of the sea. It's it's very important for them. And in fact, actually, I think it's worth stressing that uh, when we talk about maritime environments and, and human interaction and exploitation of that, you know, it's not just about this sort of long-distance trade. It's not about you know silks and spices necessarily. Um, so you know, if you think about the, the stone towns of the Gulf Coast. The extent to which they are dependent entirely on the maritime environment is truly remarkable. So you think about the building materials, whether it's the, the coral or, or the beach rock, um, it's all coming from the sea. That the plaster, which is used to, to kind of cover the walls and, 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 and the roofs, is, is in many cases obtained from burning seashells to get the lime. Um, you know, the, the further afield, I mean, the, the roof poles, of, certainly of the elite buildings, which are made of um, mangrove poles, um, you know, these are obtained really from the Rafiji Delta uh, in, in Kenya and East Africa. So, you know, for the basics of just building your house, you have to engage with the, the sea. And, and in fact, it's not just um, the material culture, but also um, I think it's worth stressing that, uh, you know, the sea is also so fundamentally important for the basic uh, you know, stuff of life, you know, food. Um, so here in the Emirates, the word for rice is aish, you know, life, because everybody depends on it. Go to Egypt, what's aish? Well, that's bread, basically. It's a different kind of economy. Um, but, the, but the point is that, that rice isn't grown here. Rice is coming in from the Indian subcontinent. And it's this uh, absolute orientation towards these maritime networks that makes life possible. Um, in fact, you know, uh, in the 18th century, uh, there's a problem with piracy. Um, the pirates are attacking the, the, the rice ships going from India to the Gulf. And so one of the local rulers of India calls in the Yarabid Sultan of Oman, who sends a fleet to get rid of the pirates and restore the flow of rice back to the Gulf. So I think these sea lanes are fundamentally important, not just for building your houses, but for feeding your children. That's interesting. And I think, um, yeah, it all comes back to this concept of identity, right? And identity is manifested through food, through architecture, through construction, all of these um, aspects of it. I was wondering, Nora, what you thought, like, if, if we, we as, a, as archaeologists, we always want to go back in a time machine right, which doesn't exist apparently yet. Um, but if you went back, if you went back to the Neolithic period and, and you were talking to the people 
uh, who you excavated in, on Marawa Island, um, and, and, it, well, and you don't know what language they're speaking, so you can't ask them. But do you think, like if you said, where are you from, they would say the sea? Because I think they might. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> well, how would I know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. But, they, but like, if you think about... If you think about the burials, even in Jebel Buhes in that period, their adornment, their jewelry, and jewelry is a major marker of identity. It's all seashells. Yeah. So, um, right. again, yeah, no, of course, they are, they are of the sea. This, I'm agreeing with you. Um, I don't think, uh, it, I don't think we, I mean, typically, the earlier thought was that these are fishermen that are hopping from island to island to island to just move where the resources are most abundant. Now, because of the existence of Mrawah, MR11 on Mrawah, um, we know that's not the case. We know that they are establishing a central place where they can all collectively um, uh, collectively go back to. And, and we kind of theorize that it's a place of great significance for them. And so we don't think that um, we don't think that they just happen to build settlements here and there or they just happen to um, uh, establish a settlement somewhere it's it's very much it's much more calculated and it's much more meaningful for them to be utilizing these spaces now not every not every I mean some of these places have been occupied before the full extent of the marine transgression, which is, okay, so before the filling of the Gulf to its current extent. So um, for Ra in Rara, for instance, uh, 6.5 thousand BC, um, actually 6.6 thousand BC from new carbon dates, but um, they, they going that far back, the, the, the sea was out something like less than 14 meters below present median sea levels. It was really far away if we're using different uh, studies to create this baseline. But of course, this doesn't mean that this is one study. And of course, we need to study this further. Um, but it, it doesn't, uh, I mean, Mrawah was probably an archipelago that connected somehow to, we think, Tarif. There is this kind of, if you look at Khor al Bazm and the sea in the Western region, you'll see like a shallow water peninsula kind of going across where the uh, deeper Khor is. And we kind of think that was probably linked up and so it would have had them going back and forth and that's why they established their settlements on the southern parts uh, mostly so that they can uh, have easier access to the sea, which is, uh, like I'm saying, is, is something that probably facilitated their trade routes, it's facilitated their connectivity to other Neolithic uh, settlements, uh, you know, spread across the uh, Adhafra Islands. And it also probably facilitated things like uh, resource gathering. So, for example, I just came back from Syria, Sirbanias last week and we found a lot of natural flint. And flint is a kind of a stone that they use back in the Stone Age to create arrowheads from it. It feels like glass. It's um, when the uh, Zaid National Museum opens, you'll have a lovely selection to go and check. <laughs> and um, so these these uh, flint outcrops are found on like Delma. Uh, they're found on uh, Sirbanias, Jabal Dhanna, and uh, Ras al Jala, which is near Grain al Aish. So we know that on Marawah there is no natural flint source. So they must be getting it from somewhere else. Uh, we know on Gaga there's no uh, natural hematite or pyrolysite source, but there's black and red plaster vessels, so we know they're getting those uh, minerals from somewhere like Sirbanias or uh, Delma, which are um, natural salt dome geology. So it's a natural source of uh, different pigments with salt dome geology. It's, it's this sulfur that's pushed up and when it gets pushed up it pushes all sorts of things up with it and it, it kind of has the topography of like a, a, a more igneous formation but rea in reality it's just salt um, and and different minerals so that's why if you go to Sirbanias or Delma you'll see that it the color of these geological formations is red and black specifically because it's it's a byproduct of, of what has happened 500 million years ago Okay, Mark nods, yes. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, going back to what Peter was saying about this idea of identity, you know, with people are being of the sea. I mean, 
I think actually, um, obviously, people's identities are uh, complex, and 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 you can have actually, you know, multiple identities. And I think people living on the coast, absolutely, they're they're involved with the pearl fishing trade. They're involved with catching fish. They're involved with you know far off trade with 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 other lands. Um, but also, uh, rather, you know, sort of uh, paradoxically, they're also herders and farmers. And, and in fact, there's this sort of uh, seasonal migration, the tahwil, between the coast and the interior, um, in which uh, people would, you know, migrate as a whole community and, and, and move from their, their fishing nets to their, to their palm trees. So, for example, when I worked at... Um, Zayed University a few years ago, we did an oral history project with the Zab of Jazir al Hamra. And, and we talked to the old generation, and, and they, would, they told us that basically in, in the summer, people would uh, get up and go, and they would move to their palm groves in, in Khat, up in, uh, in Ras al And even they owned land on, on the, the Omani Batna, and they were crossing the, the mountains to farm their date palms. And then they would come back, and then, you know, reassume their, their old jobs as fishermen and, and, and merchants and other things. So I think the, 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 the really kind of ingenuity, I think, of the people who, who lived here in the pre-modern period was that they were able to exploit every ecological niche in, in what is, after all, quite a marginal environment. And, and that ability to, to, to maximize output with very limited resources, I think is, is really a, a testament to the ingenuity of the Emirati people. Do you think that's possible, Tim, because all of those marginal environments, well, I, I wouldn't agree with you about being marginal, but that's okay. Um, they're more marginal than some, but, but, um, but do you think that there is something in terms of these interconnections which exist, do you think there's something unique that's here, that's because the coast to the desert to the inland plains to the mountains is actually not a long distance. Yeah, I think, I think that's they, possible. They are, uh, this is niche, niche environmental I, constructions. I think, uh, I think um, ultimately, you know, this, go back to this idea of uh, you know, necessity as the mother of invention. So, so if you think about where the Neolithic Revolution begins, um, it's not in the great river valleys of, of uh, you know, the Euphrates and the Tigris and the Nile, because these are super abundant areas. You don't need to farm, basically. It's, you just walk out and there it all is, you know, God's bounty. Um, but it's in these marginal environments that people really have to uh, innovate. That's where people have to, to struggle. And I think struggle makes us better people, frankly. Um, and I think that's why, you know, things like the domestication of the camel, for example, something that, you know, you, you've talked about a lot before. Well, you've argued that, uh, you know, it's happening here in the Emirates, you know, and, and, and you know, I think um, this, the, the, the very hardship of the landscape, I think, you know, pushes people to excel. So we kind of, we haven't got much time left, so let's ask, I mean, let's bring this round back full circle. Um, the circle of connectivity. <laughs> so, uh, nice title, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so, um, what are identifiable circles of connectivity that we can see nowadays that possibly do have links that go back over the thousands of years that we've just discussed? I might just answer one aspect of it, and then Tim, I'm sure, will jump in. But, but I, uh, when we talk about these expanding circles of like the Neolithic and then the Bronze Age, and then the Arabian trade routes develop, and then the the Indian Ocean trade system expand, and then in the early Islamic period, the expansion into Southeast Asia, you know, the, the discovery of an Arabian Dao off the coast of Indonesia and Singapore, um, the Belatan shipwreck. The, these are these are circles, and from my mind, as a as a archaeologist historian that thinks in the long array of history, I actually think then that it's the 16th century when things become very bigger, um, and partly it's it's because there is all of a sudden there are these European powers which make their presence in in the Gulf, the Portuguese first, then the Dutch, and then the British, um, and that creates dynamics here which which uh, result precisely in a cultural way rather than a geographical way what Tim was saying that they actually result in a emerging globalization and I think that is I see that period even though it was a period of great struggle 
and colonialism and violence, that that period is a period in which uh, there is a, a, a pivot towards a more global uh, world. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, what you're talking about is the, the Colombian exchange and, and the integration of, uh, of, of Europe into um, the Indian Ocean networks. I mean, um, but arguably, I, I would actually put it a little bit later, okay? I mean, it's different uh, stages of the same process. But for me, I think the 18th century is, is the key point because by the 18th century, the colonies in America are starting to really contribute to the world economy. And, and you know, by this time, you're getting um, you know, the Spanish uh, crossing the Pacific with um, various uh, galleons linking up to the Atlantic trade, linking up to the Indian Ocean trade, and you start to get a truly globalized economy. And it's in this period that pearls from the Arabian Gulf are being exported, not just to, to, to Europe, but as far, off, as, as far away as, as, as America. And I think um, the growing demand from the New World ultimately drives the expansion of the, the pearling industry in the 19th century. But I think really the 18th century is something to focus on here in Arabia, because in many ways it is the threshold period. So many of the present tribal identities, so many of the, the ruling dynasties, so many of the great monuments, like Ghassar al Hassan here in Abu Dhabi, are products of that 18th century globalization. So, uh, thank you guys for that. Um, we're going to move on to questions because we've got like five minutes left. So, if anybody has any questions, I'll just walk over and mic you. All right, then. Thank you guys for taking time out of your day to come and listen. Um, thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's